basis, and chances are you do. You... If you use the internet on a daily basis, and chances are you do, you probably don't put much thought into cybersecurity. You know, your network connections, the pages you visit. If you use the internet on a daily basis, and chances are you do, you probably don't put much thought into cybersecurity. You know, your network connections, the pages you visit, the files you download. You should be thinking about these all the time. Welcome to And Security for All. Your host is Kim Hakem. We're here to help you understand, in general terms, how and why your cybersecurity should be kept in check. Now, here is Kim Hakem. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of And Security for All. I'm Kim Hakem, your host, and um, we're excited for another week of um, chatting with our guests today. We just got back from Denver. We had a great event there yesterday. We got in early this morning, and we are going to be taking off to Kansas City next week, and then we have St. Louis. So all of you guys out there, if you happen to be in one of those cities, uh, make sure you connect with me and stop by. We would love to see you. Our events have been great and looking forward to being in Kansas City next week. Today, I have a, a new guest that I haven't met in the past. I have uh, Chad Goff. He is the owner and founder of for Discovery, and today we're going to talk to him about what For Discovery does, and we're going to talk a little bit about trade secrets and insider threats. So, welcome to the show, Chad. Hi, Kim. Hey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. How's it? Uh, how's it going in your neck of the woods today? It's going well. It's been a it's been a busy week. I think with the Memorial Day holiday, uh, everybody's still trying to cram five days worth of work into four days. So yeah, yeah, that was we were in Denver yesterday, and we had a great turnout. But it probably would have been a little bit better if we didn't do it the week of Memorial Day. I think that's a yeah. lesson to be learned because not everyone can get away when you've already had Monday off. So it's definitely been a crazy week. And here we are in June. We're into June already. We're halfway through 2023. Can you believe it? It's gone so fast. So tell us a little bit about you and um, about how you founded For Discovery and how you how, how long have you had this company and just a little background on you. Sure. So I got started off in information security, probably in the, the late 90s. Um, and, you know, back then it was a lot of engineering and operations and, uh, uh, you know, forensics and, and investigations weren't really a thing back then. But, you know, everybody kind of got started off doing penetration testing and policy writing. Um, and I, I always liked you know, doing penetration tests, but I I found the sort of the autopsy or figuring out what happened after a penetration test, what kind of, you know, artifacts were left behind, what kind of breadcrumbs were there about the intruder, uh, a little bit more interesting and, you know, kind of realized that um, it was early at the time, but I realized there was actually industry for this, um, you know, digital forensics and consulting services. So, from there, I kind of spun off and, um, you know, I've had four discovery for, I think we just celebrated our 14th birthday a couple of weeks ago. Well, that's great. Congratulations on that. Yeah. So is that what you started out at? I mean, cause it's interesting. We just now are starting to hear pen test. I mean, pen testing, you didn't even hear that word 10 years ago. So as you know, it was a big topic yesterday on our panel. We had one of our CISOs happen to be a pen tester. So, um, where, how, when did you like evolve into becoming? Were you a pen tester to start with, or how did that evolve? Yeah, it was penetration testing. And, you know, I worked for a Fortune 100, um, the early 90s, or I'm sorry, the late 90s, early 2000s. And, you know, there was a big security push and initiative, you know, at probably a little earlier than most other places there. And, uh, you know, they were big on securely developing applications. So as the, the organization would want to do an initiative and build an application, whether it be like a website or uh, an IVR system to talk to a backend database, um, 
you know, they generally got security involved pretty early to kind of at least review the architecture for some of these applications that they were doing because it was all like ASP.NET back then. And um, a lot of those had some pretty serious holes in them if they weren't developed properly. And, uh, you know, that was back when they had sort of the, the NIMDA worms and the SQL Slammer type worms that, that kind of took over some of the organizations and, you know, there's a lot of response to, you know, outsider attacks, plus all these, all this malware that was running through corporations. And um, that's kind of how it all started. So who would be your typical, like, what is a typical client of yours? And what, what are you guys actually doing for your clients? So these days it runs the gamut, but it's primarily um, law firms and corporations. So we do a lot of work for um, civil litigation related to almost anything electronic that you can think of that might be involved in litigation, whether it be text messages, emails, cloud data, um, you know, laptops, storage devices, uh, almost anything you can think of that would be electronic uh, involved in litigation, like medical records. Um, those are all electronic now from EMR systems. So it's all of that type of data. So I guess, um, for example, I had a past employee a long time ago that, you know, turned her laptop back into me and she wiped everything off of it. And if I was going to pursue, if I would have pursued anything legal, I would have had to get a forensic, you know, I guess a forensic investigator or someone to, I guess you can still retract that information that they would clean off their laptop or is that possible? It is. And, and that's um, still pretty common these days. So, you know, a, a, an employee departs and it may be under suspicious circumstances. Maybe they just went to go work somewhere else, but they'll end up turning their laptop in. And, you know, generally the company wants what's on the laptop, right? There's documents, there's all kinds of other information that they generated as part of their normal course of business. Um, that's got some value to the company. So they like to get in there and, and be able to at least get access to that data and transfer it to somebody else within the organization. And there, there are a lot of situations where, you know, on the way out the door, um, they'll install some software and, you know, wipe content or, or information from their corporate laptop. Sometimes it's just um, in an attempt to sort of maintain their personal privacy because there's a little bit less of a line with personal and work than there used to be. So, you know, there could be some personal websites on there, some banking information that they're concerned with, and they might just kind of like want to scrub their internet history or some personal data on there. And sometimes it's a little bit more malicious where, you know, maybe they've copied off all of the corporate documents to some sort of, you know, USB thumb drive or, uploaded them to the cloud somewhere and that that deletion may be a little bit more intentional where they're kind of trying to hide their tracks as far as information they may have taken or stolen. So are you, so are those, do you get a lot of clients? Are you seeing a lot of clients that come to you for that, for that kind of, you know, work? It is, especially when, um, you know, the employee resigns under sort of suspicious circumstances and depending on the role, right, um, you know, they may go to uh, a direct competitor or they may have knowledge of upcoming products or corporate initiatives that the company's working on that haven't been made public yet where, you know, if you go to work to a, a direct competitor and you say, well, you know, I used to work over here and I know that in three years they're going to be launching this product, um, you know, it can cause some damage. So what kind of... Um going back to well first of all you told me that you also teach so so what is it again that you're teaching and how often are you doing that yeah so i've been teaching at the paul university in chicago for um i just reached my 10th year and wow. i teach graduate and undergraduate classes on forensics and incident response there so what um are you still doing that are you still traveling to chicago to teach um, it's a little bit more virtual now, especially after COVID, oh. but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm still doing it just wrapped up there on quarters instead of semesters. So I just wrapped up 
uh, the quarter on um, Tuesday. It was supposed to be Monday, but the world, they pushed it to Tuesday. So just wrapped oh. up. Okay. And so what are you got? So what are, who is typically taking those classes? Would that be someone that's like a computer science major or something? Yeah, like they've got a good program, both undergrad and graduate in cybersecurity. Okay. So. And then what are you doing as far as, you know, our topic today, trade secrets and insider threats? What, how involved are you on that for being, you know, from a company like for discovery? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just talking about insider threats and trade secrets, you know, a lot of companies spend a, a lot of time, effort and money in security, right? Whether it be firewalls or network intrusion or, um, antivirus, they spend a lot of money trying to keep their company secure, right? Pen tests, external audits. Um, but there's always that factor of your employees, right? These are the people that you hired. Um, you gave them user accounts. You gave them access to a lot of your data. And in some cases, that's confidential information, depending on the company, right? It could be source code. It could be um, engineering diagrams and documents. There's all sorts of you know, intellectual property and, and trade secret information that companies have that they don't want disclosed, but, you know, people need to access it on a daily basis. Um, you know, DLP or data loss prevention used to be uh, never heard of outside of really, really large organizations. Now that has become a little bit more ingrained into a lot of the different email platforms and cloud platforms that we use and DLP is even now part of just the standard antivirus, anti-malware solutions that a lot of companies have. But, you know, with DLP, um, like everything else, it's sort of rule-based, right? You have to tell it what you're looking for. And oftentimes, um, you know, to keep the number of alerts down, you know, they, they're tuned um, tuned pretty fine so that it's only catching, you know, the most critical types of information. Like it might only catch like social security numbers, but only in certain formats, for example, or for some companies. Or only so what is, the, that are, what is you know, DLP? Can you tell our listeners what that is? Sure. So DLP stands for data loss prevention. Um, and it's, it's basically, you know, it can sit on your computer or it can sit um, in the cloud and basically like almost be like a proxy for your for your web browsing. Um, another place it sits often is like at the email where it scans incoming and outgoing email. And depending on your organization, um, let's say you're let's say you're in healthcare, right? Um, you have certain information that you aren't allowed to transmit that where it's not encrypted. Um, you know, those could be medical records and social security. So they, they put rules in there to look for that type of information where if you try to email something that's got patient information or social security numbers and it's not encrypted, that DLP solution will actually catch that and it'll sort of quarantine it and won't send it out or at least notify someone that um, that type of information is being attempted to be sent out by a certain individual. You know, for other companies, if you're a development company, maybe you have source code and there might be a DLP agent on your laptop um, where it looks at certain file types, right? The extensions for uh, programming languages. And it can actually put rules in place to prevent you from copying source code to a thumb drive that you plug into your laptop. So you can plug in a thumb drive and you can copy off, um, you know, a presentation, but you can't copy source code. So it's actually inspecting the documents and the content. And based on certain rules, um, it can log or alert different types of activity that you do based on, based on those rules. And sometimes, um, you know, we'll get involved in matters where companies do have DLP and we get brought in to do an investigation based on the fact that there's a certain employee who's been setting off alerts. And oftentimes we actually get in there and get access to the data and do the forensics. We'll find that 
there's a lot more that was going on, right? The, where the DLP was only catching maybe 10 or 15% of the most sensitive documents, but there were a lot of other documents that were being sent out, but for whatever reason, their DLP didn't have rules for that. So there were presentations and lists of clients and customers that were being copied or sent out or uploaded to cloud storage that just weren't captured because of the, the way that some of the rules were set up in their DLP type systems. And so <clears throat> I, I guess that's a perk, obviously, for people to have that kind of software on their computer. I know my daughter right. worked for a pretty large uh, corporation. And I know when she was trying to get, because she lives in New York, and when she was trying to use my accountant for her uh, tax returns, she couldn't get it sent through because it yep. had her social security number. And, you know, so I thought that was pretty impressive. I was like, well, that's pretty cool but it's a very very large company so they have they have the means and the funds to be able to you know secure all of their um, users in that organization so what are the smaller companies supposed what what is your advice for them if they can't afford some of this um, software that is quite expensive yeah unfortunately that leaves a really big blind spot for them right and, and that's where smaller organizations need to do a better job around um, at least educating their employees about the proper use of corporate data, um, some of the policies and procedures that the employees may sign uh, need to specifically address that. Um, and then they have to also do a better job on like access control, right? Where oftentimes, you know, if you've got a user account on the system, you can pretty much access all the different places and, and, and files that you want to access. So um, more stringent access controls will at least narrow down what they're allowed to see. Um, but aside from that, you know, it's, it is a, a, a pretty big blind spot where uh, an employee who's a salesperson may have access to an entire corporate CRM of customers, upcoming deals, uh, the value of each account. And if they decide that they're going to leave that company and go to work for a competitor and they want all that account information, it's as simple as just downloading the spreadsheets out of the CRM and copying to a thumb drive and um, walking out the door. And most companies have no visibility into that. And they don't find out until they start losing accounts that they used to have so what are what are some examples of some of the like disaster type disastrous type things that you've seen because these companies aren't protected um wow i probably have a ton of war stories but um you know a couple that comes to mind was uh it was a, a large food processing manufacturer and they were working on, they were working with their accountants because they actually planned to do, it was a, they planned to get some funding and they also planned to acquire another company. So as part of this, they were working with some outside financial advisors to kind of get their books balanced and get, get ready for this so they could be properly valued. And their uh, financial advisors came back and told them they were missing quite a few million dollars. Um, and they had no idea where it was coming from. And uh, this company's uh, chief financial officer, CFO, was a, was a longtime friend of the, the owner. And he was really the only individual that had the, the capabilities to um, wire some of this money or uh, generate some of these fraudulent invoices that they had seen. So this became a, uh, a, a late night um you know, get the computer at one o'clock in the morning when the office is closed with the security um, for the building and then, you know, do the forensics and return the computer the next day so that, or that same evening so that, you know, nobody knew that the computer was being cloned and copied. And then, you know, do the forensics on that to, to find out that, um, you know, for the last at least 10 or 15 years that, you know, somebody had been laundering money out of the company. It was uh, the owner's, you know, best friend that he hired and brought up as a CFO. So, so then um, 
so so what 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 happened i mean what what happens next um that's where it goes to goes to litigation you know the goes into the courts the attorneys work it out and uh Unfortunately, when you start getting into the court system and the, you know, it, it goes through the, the legal process, you know, it can take years. Years. And, you know, our yeah. investigation is done. Um, uh, so we don't necessarily get the end of every story, which is kind of troubling. But on some of them, at least, you know, I, I do get asked to come back and um, be the expert witness and testify at trial regarding the, the information and, and the, the data that was found. So. Yeah. And unfortunately, our government and especially since COVID, you know, things are so slow in the legal system. These attorneys are just making tons of money on legal hours because everything's so slow. So, yeah, the uh, the courts definitely got backed up during COVID until they um, took them almost a year to figure out how to use Zoom. So and then the yeah. attorneys couldn't figure it out. I, was, uh, I still love that. That's the attorney that's really that was a cat. Funny. that that made its way through social media. So what, um, what are you seeing in the healthcare industry? You know, what, what are some of the challenges? Because I know, I know physically in the healthcare industry, they're so backed up. I, I hear we're like three years behind, but when it comes to trade secrets and insider threats in the healthcare industry, what are you seeing there? Um, from an insider perspective, not too much. With the healthcare industry, it's all about the, the electronic medical record. So most hospitals now are, are fully uh, electronic or digital related to your, your medical record. Um, and unfortunately, with all that digital information um, and the regulations that are surrounding the healthcare industry, there's a lot of data that's being generated about your medical record. So think of it as like metadata or data about your medical record. It's not necessarily part of your medical record. Um, you know, you can go in for a, a typical health checkup physical and, you know, all the way down to what screen someone is looking at and when your labs got posted and when they got sent out and when they came back, when uh, a doctor looked at the results of your labs are all timestamped as part, you know, it's not necessarily part of your medical record, but there's a lot of audit logs that exist around medical records um, that are, you know, they, they exist for a reason. It's generally part of CMS's requirements, but you know, they're being used quite a bit to in medical malpractice cases to determine who knew what, when, and how. So where are you used? Like, is it usually the healthcare or the financial? Where do you find that you're most um, used as an investigator? Is it more on the financial side? Um, everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Healthcare-related cases. Um, we do a lot of mobile devices that were involved in uh, collisions, so accident reconstruction, you know, determining if somebody was texting on their phone while, or playing angry. Oh, wow. Well, how how do you do that? How, tell us about that. That's I find that so interesting that you can actually find out that information. Yeah, so phones keep a ton of data about us, right? Um, they keep information about uh, your latitude, your longitude, your location. Um, a lot of the apps that you use keep information about when you use them and all that's available on the phone where we basically just collect the phone, you know, do a forensic preservation or capture of that device and then all that information is available to be investigated. Um, you know, we've had situations where uh, there was an accident and, you know, I can determine that the person in the accident was skipping songs on Spotify at the time of the collision, right? So it's like they got three seconds into a song and hit next, three seconds into a song and hit next. And it's even um, even granular enough on the devices to know that it wasn't connected to CarPlay, right? It wasn't connected to Bluetooth, that they had actually picked their phone up, had their phone in their hand, unlocked it by looking at it with Face ID, and then were skipping songs. So. Um, that kind of meets that distracted drivers. Um, so scary. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I noticed um, you had, or you did a CNN interview about um, the Malaysia flight 370 and yeah. um, the pas passengers mobile devices. So tell us a little bit about that and, you know, whatever you can tell us and what that interview was about and what you did discover. Yeah. So that was one where the, the plane sort of just disappeared. Right. And uh, I don't think they found it to this day. But there were a lot of questions that came up where, um, you know, if uh, several weeks had gone by at that point in time and the plane wasn't found. But um, the question that was being asked a lot was if they did find the plane, you know, one of the things that all the passengers probably had on them at that point in time was a cell phone. So, you know, if the cell phone was found at the bottom of the ocean, um, could you retrieve the information off of that device to maybe see a video that someone was recording at the last minutes or any camera footage that somebody took that would have told you what was happening on the plane, even though it wasn't connected to a cell tower and couldn't transmit, right? So sort of that, that locked up in airplane mode recording video that's it's not going anywhere. Um, and I said, sure, I, you know, there's, there's, not really any reason why you shouldn't be able to do that. Um, you know, mobile devices these days are, um, you know, some of them are, are waterproof to a point. Even if they aren't, there's uh, a lot of, the way they're put together kind of makes them almost indestructible. Um, and, and that came back with, well, you know, I know that I've dropped my phone in the sink before and, you know, I've never been able to use it after that. There's no way you can do anything if it was on the bottom of the ocean. So they actually um, worked with the Chicago Set Aquarium and they set up an example or an exhibit where they used a saltwater floor, salt, saltwater floor um, that they had there. And they took a, a Samsung phone and started recording a video and then dropped it in there. And they essentially simulated saltwater um, something like two or 300 feet of pressure and he left it sit for about a week. Uh, and then I had to go get it and uh, essentially take it apart and pull the chip off the phone that stored the data and um, was able to read about 85 or 90% of that data uh, off that device. So it's kind of, it was a fun project. So what happened with the Malaysia? I mean, what did you find out? Did you find information from the cell phones? No, this was just more of a, could you do it if they found the plane sort of scenario. Okay. So nothing that that's still so fascinating that that is just gone. That plane. I know. I think weird. Netflix just did a little documentary on it and they're still looking for it. So huh, I'll have to watch that. I, I, I try to catch all those type type of documentaries. So tell us a little bit about cyber squatting. What is that? Um, are you referring to like when um, like business email compromise type cases where they do um, where there's like a wire fraud transfer type matter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, you know, the business email compromise cases are, are typically the ones where someone in a chain of emails has either been, um, compromised or or successfully fished in some way. Um, and they may register a domain name that's one or two letters off or maybe like a, a reversal of a couple of letters, switching out a couple of letters in a domain name and impersonate some people. Uh, it, it actually happens quite a lot during, you know, tax season where they'll say, hey, you know, I'm, you know, your accountant and they'll, just change a couple letters on the domain and, you know, say, Hey, you know, I need you to email me your W2s or, um, you know, your, your tax information, your bank statements. And they kind of get in the middle of these transactions where they then use that data to, um, they'll, they'll file a tax return early on your behalf for a refund or a lot of the refund wired somewhere else, not your bank account. And in the business world, um, typically they'll say, uh, you know, hey, we're Acme Corporation and um, we're switching banks, you know, attaches a PDF that's got our new banking and wiring and routing information. Can you make sure you update it on your end? 
Uh, and then, you know, oftentimes it's someone who just doesn't pay attention and um, doesn't pick up the phone and call somebody at the company to verify that they're changing banks. And they'll, they'll put that in and um, a, a wire transfer will go out to the wrong person and, and generally that money will be gone. So um, to how, what would your advice be to, to how do you spot like an insider threat and, you know, what are some signs? Like what would your, I'm sure when you're um, instructing at the university, I'm sure you talk about this all the time. Like what, what are signs that we probably just don't even pay attention to, but we should be paying attention? Um. Yeah, it's really difficult to tell sometimes, right? Like, uh, you just don't know. Uh, it, it's so reactionary where you, you're, you're like, I had no idea that this person was so um, disgruntled or, um, you know, I, I didn't know that they were going to quit their job and, and go work for a competitor or even start a competing business. But, um you know, usually just providing employees with a safe space to, to make, um, to do some notifications, I, I think is probably the best place to start. So are you referring to maybe like just their social media and is it, do you feel like it's the employer's responsibility to be following their employees, social media to find out what is going on with them? No, not at all. I mean, that's impossible, right? Like um, mm -hmm. nobody has the bandwidth to do that. Um, but, you know, internally, right. Like at the water cooler, mm -hmm. you know, you may have a, an inkling that, something's going on or somebody's going to be resigning soon or somebody's taking a, a job offer somewhere else. And, you know, if they're able to go to their manager with that in a confidential way, or at least, um, you know, maybe even anonymously that, that may help. How serious are non-competes and are employees <laughs> nowadays afraid of non-competes anymore? I feel like they used to a long time ago, you just, we're not going to violate a non-compete. Do you feel like it's changed? Um, it is. Uh, again, uh, I'll do the obligatory. I'm not a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, non-competes have changed. You're right. At, at some point in time, you know, back in the day, um, violating a non-compete was um, something you just didn't do. And then it does take somebody, you know, generally with some money who's willing to fight that uh who will say that the non-compete sort of non-enforceable right they're kind of overbearing and you know i think enough of those cases happened over time where um when attorneys started ready non-competes they they realized that a lot of what they were putting in there would be non-enforceable so they kind of backed them down a little bit um and now i'm seeing that you know, there are a couple of states, and I think, you know, California is generally first with everything when it comes to um, changing laws. But I have seen something related to, to California um, because it is so tech heavy in the Silicon Valley um, going to basically ban non competes altogether. Well, how can they do that? How can they ban non competes? I don't know. I guess it's just the, it's California, it's the tech industry. You know, you want to be able to, work at Facebook and then go work at Twitter. Right. Um, maybe not work at Twitter these days. I think it's right. <laughs> starting to blow up, but, um, you know, where before that would be, you know, social media to social media that they just are realizing that it's just not, it's not possible. So how are employers supposed to protect their, you know, their, um, you know, their, their private, you know, equity and what they founded. I mean, how did that, how are employees supposed to protect themselves from the employee that leaves and takes their ideas with them? It's a great question. I don't think we've quite gotten to the answer to that yet. Um, 
you know, I, I think just a couple of weeks ago, I saw that a, a large amount of Twitter source code was found on GitHub, right? And that had to have come from an insider, right? somebody that had access to Twitter source code. Um, so you're going to start to see more of that. I mean, we see it, you know, we, we see it in Hollywood all the time, you know, just, just yeah. through social media, things that get leaked all the time that, you know, so now you have this, just take Bravo, you know, I'm a Bravo person, you know, like how is like, just as a example, how does Bravo protect themselves from the leaks, you know, that are coming through social media? Um, there was one that just, uh, popped up, which I thought was kind of, um, genius, uh, the other day. And it was, it came from Apple because, you know, Apple is notorious for wanting to keep their, their product launches and some of their information secret. And there's always the, the people that had the information in advance. Um, one of the, I don't know. Twitter blogger people that was generally had insider knowledge of uh, Apple products and software um, that was coming out basically had to sort of shut things down. And it, he was getting the information from his sister who was an Apple employee. And um, Apple had given out, I think this was related to like Final Cut or something, one of their products being available as an iPad app for the first time. Um, when they had kind of disclosed that information, they they disclosed it in different detail levels and to everybody else. So they said only this product would be available on the iPad on April 8th. They told somebody else it would be available on April 6th. And they told somebody else it would be available on April 13th. Um, they got to give everybody different information. And then sure enough, they waited for the, the leak to show up on the internet and they were able to take the details of the leak and, and tie that back to a certain individual. Sorry, I think I uh, got a little disconnected there. I don't know what happened. Happened. Yeah. And I, I think there's there'll be other companies that end up um, using that type of tactic to to deter, you know, at least systemic internal leaks from, from insiders. So um, I don't know of any other ones that have, that have done that recently, or I can't remember any more current ones from the news, but um, I know the Apple one was kind of unique in the way they did it by providing just different dates and, and information to each one of the employees. So. I'm trying to think of some other cases that might be out there that were recent. Um, I'm just drawing a blank. But as far as the the cybersecurity and the the non compete and employment laws in California, I mean, you know, they were kind of first with the the it was it 1386 out of California where they were requiring companies to disclose to residents if their information was subject to a data breach. And um, a lot of other states kind of followed that. But, you know, what they're doing with the typical non-competes now, I, you know, I don't know that it's being enforced. I don't know that it's actually passed as a bill, but uh, they're definitely trying to push that through. And I've seen other states, I think New York and, uh, and one other one trying to push that through as well. And, you know, there, there is a good statistic that came out where it was like, you know, 80% of people, 87% of people who leave their jobs um, do take data when they leave. And, you know, that statistic is out of there. And I think that's a, it might be a generational thing too. And um, where, you know, as you work on something at a company or organization, you kind of take ownership of it. Um, you know, this is the product that I was working on. It's the product that I was developing. And it, it almost gives people like a, a, a right or entitlement to the data that they 
develop within a company, right? Like this is something I created, this is mine. And when they leave the company, they think they generally have ownership of that. They generally forget that they were being compensated by a company to write that and the ownership of that property belongs with the company. So a large amount of these people um, will just sort of back up the stuff that they've worked on um, for their company when they, when they leave and when they resign. Oftentimes, I, I would say, you know, out of the 87%, I would probably say half of that isn't malicious um, in any way. It's not that I think they're, they're taking it with the intent of, you know, leaking it on the internet or, or causing damage to the company or even necessarily taking it and um, trying to go to a competitor with it and use it against them or start a competing business. I, I think it's just a, a lot of this information gets backed up because I don't know, they're pack rats and, and they want it. So um, it'll end up being stored. And the, the, the interesting problem with a lot of that is, is if, if you're aware that it happens and it is a trade secret and you find out that people are taking it, um, you kind of lose your ability to call it a secret if you, you know, don't put security controls around it and allow for um, people to, to walk away with your data, right? So if everybody's allowed to walk away with it, um, you can't necessarily call it a call it a secret in any way. Um, another question that got posted is, uh, you know, new technology like chat, GPT and AI, making it harder to get um, to, to source or, or share stolen data. Um, I think it's a little too early to tell. Um, I know there's a, there are warnings related to, you know, if you want to use something like ChatGPT and you want to use it on your own data, um, right now that's kind of hard and uh, expensive um, to have your data sort of baked into AI to ask it questions. Um, Microsoft is working on it. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the name right now, but it will be coming out soon from a Microsoft standpoint with AI on top of your own corporate data. But right now, I'd say if you if you want to use ChatGPT or any sort of AI, um, you know, don't post your source code, don't post your your corporate documents in there or anything anything secretive that you would want to to not have it understand so well chad i'm sorry that i put you on the spot we must have jinxed ourselves because we were talking about this pre-show how it hasn't happened or have gotten cut off and probably all year <laughs> and we were talking about for our, our audience um i'm in st louis and we were talking about being in a drought and i looked outside and my sprinkler system was going off and right when i looked everything disconnected so i don't know what happened so i apologize <laughs> No problem. I think it's the gods telling me turn off the water outside. And so, yep, there anyway, are gremlins so, somewhere. Yeah, so I apologize. I have no idea. I did not touch anything, and everything just went <laughs> offline. So sorry about that. But sure, anyway, that's what they say. Yeah, back to Chat GPT. I find that so interesting. If you want to just expand a little more on, you know, um, how how is that going to affect, you know, stolen data and just what we are going to believe and what we're not going to believe. And on, you know, you being, you know, an instructor, you know, what are you seeing in class with chat GPT as well? I think it's a little early um, to make, to figure out what's going to happen with a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, they, they just kind of dropped it on us in November or December of last year. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's gotten a lot of news and a lot of traction recently. Um, you know, there's been some AI in a lot of the forensic tools that we've used for a long time. Um, but that was always related to things like photo recognition, right? Where if we have, for example, a cell phone that's got tens of thousands of photos on it, um, we can use AI uh, that'll actually look at the photos and kind of do like, uh, um, you know, Apple has this on your iPhone now. If you ever go to like 
your your photo library you can actually just search for something you can search for a chicken right you can search for an egg you can search for uh an object and it'll bring back all the photos with that object in it um and that's been around and it's been available for forensics for a while um you know especially used in law enforcement quite a bit because they can say show me all the photos of guns or drugs or money and uh, a lot of that will come back so um but with the the chat gpt it's you know until they figure out a way where you can use your own data um essentially siloed where you kind of have like the overall ai engine but then you can take your own data and train it where it doesn't get shared with everybody else. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's definitely interesting to see where we are going, you know, in the future. And, you know, are we, well, especially like right now, I assume the writer's strike still happening. I believe it is. I haven't watched TV all week because I've been traveling, but are we going to find ourselves in a position that our movies are, you know, they're already saying there are a few movies that have been created by chat GPT. So it's just going to be interesting, the future, what the future looks like. And you're in such a great industry, what you do, because I would hate to be, well, I wouldn't hate to be a developer of some sort of software because there's a lot of really wealthy people in this world because of that. But how do you stay ahead of the game where, you know, where you might be in stealth mode and now what you've developed may not even matter anymore because something else has trumped you. So, so, so congratulations for the industry you're in because you, you can stay ahead of the game by what you're doing, but what, what do you think about, you know, where, where are these developers are going and is it going to be tougher for them to stay ahead of the race? Um, I, I think absolutely it is. Uh, I was just reading an article, I think it was last night, um, about a developer who's, well, wasn't quite a professional developer, right? Kind of was like a hobby programmer um, who I think racked up, I think it was a three or $400 bill on chat GPT over like a one or two month time period, um, but was able to finish and release an application um, that most people said would take eight or nine months to develop. So, um, you know, take nine months of development down to a month and a half with a $200 bill from using chat GPT's API. And there you go. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so I don't know. I mean, I know that, you know, they, um, oh, there was a lot of the, Twitter and Facebook, all, all those executives, they were, I didn't watch it. Somebody told me about it. They were on maybe Fox News or something. And they, and I know um, some of them were saying, we need to slow this down. Well, I, I don't think we're slowing it down. I don't, I don't think that's possible for that to happen. Can't so, put the cat back in the bag, right? Exactly. You know, and when are they, you know, because I, I think it's fun to play with chat GPT. I think, you know, I just get on there and, you know, if I'm trying to find panel questions for one of my events, I take my old questions and I put new questions in there and it's great. You know, I in a minute I have a whole new hour of content. But um, I wonder when they will start charging because, I mean, what I'm using is just free. So. Yeah, and I they. Um, I did pay for access to it, um, the professional and to get an API key so I could do, I just want to play with it. Right. I want to see like what's, what's coming out there and what's capable of. Um, so I think this is kind of the, the sandbox, like, you know, all the people that are using it for, I, I have a friend that has children and, uh, every night they'll pick a couple characters and tell chat GPT to generate a bedtime story and they're custom. You know, oh, every night cool. related to like characters and it actually does like, a, a fairly good job. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's what they're, they're trying to monetize. It's going to be, um, it's going to be much larger use cases from a corporate standpoint. And there are apps. I have one on my phone that I downloaded. It was a chat GPT tool 
And that was when I was first learning about chat GPT and I realized, okay, this is not the right one, but it did give me some free stuff in the beginning to entice me to pay. Um, it's still, I haven't deleted the app because, you know, I might eventually pay for it because it was pretty cheap. It's just, I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with the, you know, with the original chat GPT and, you know, what, how, how many apps are there? There's got to be tons, you know, I just. There's so many and there's so many that are charging exorbitant amounts of money for something that you can get for free, right? So there's a, there's a lot of fake stuff out there as well. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a lot of people you know, make money off of this right now. There are, there are, and everybody's trying to figure out the, the best way to use it. Yeah, you know, because you have, um, you you have people that are not in the cybersecurity industry that are just hearing just now today might be just hearing about Chat GPT, so they have no idea that it is free. They're probably just doing what I did and just finding an app and thinking they got the right one. So, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they're probably not in the very distant future, right? Um, there'll be a way to tack it onto your corporate Slack environment, right? And it will go back and it'll read the last five years worth of messages and tell you what all the common questions and issues in your company and organization are and how you go about, you know, making documentation out of them. Cause like, hey, this is the most common question um, being asked of us, uh, you know, on the, on our Slack channel. And, um, you know, it's been answered five or six different times, you know, let's make a knowledge base article out of this so that people don't have to ask the same question again. Um, well, what do you predict, like, cause we are coming up to about four minutes left, but um, what do you predict for the future of data for forensics and data recovery? Um, a lot of it is going to be migrating and merging with the cloud. So, um, you know, less of less information is being stored on your computer, uh, less information is being stored on your phone more of it's moving um, to the cloud. So it's gonna be um, a lot more acquisition and collection of cloud data. And do you feel that, do you feel like those two things cor correlate chat GPT and data recovery? I mean, is this gonna be a tool for you um, with forensics, chat GPT? Is that gonna help you in your profession? Um, I was having a discussion with this with somebody the other day, and I, I don't know. I, I think that's probably a lot longer, um, longer out. You know, I, I don't think that my job's in jeopardy yet from a standpoint of being able to feed it a, a laptop computer and tell me whether or not somebody's been up to anything malicious, right? Right. Um, it's going to yeah. take some time for that to catch up. Yeah, I've had conversations with people like what are going to be some of the first jobs that are going to be eliminated. And I guess we don't have to go into that since we're down to about yeah. two minutes. I don't <laughs> want to scare anyone out there. So <laughs> I'm glad I put on a cybersecurity event and it takes a person and people and people still like to see other people. So I still feel yeah. in my industry. <laughs> so. Same. You know, people like to see people and I don't think that's ever going to go away, you know, and there are some people that never want to see people and that's never going to go away as well. And that's why we do our events in a hybrid mode. So we still have a virtual option because, you know, since COVID, there is a world out there that people that are quite happy being home alone. So absolutely. Um, but still have to be, be educated and still have to keep their certifications up. But anyway, Chad, it's been great having you on the show. Can you tell, let our um, audience know where they can find you and how to get a hold of you? Um, yeah, I'm on um, LinkedIn primarily. Um, you'll find this under either my name, Chad Goff, or under For Discovery. Well, it's been great. Thanks. I, I really apologize that I had a crash and you had to uh, thank you for uh, holding the show, keeping the show together. And we didn't have to stop that. Thank you so much. And No I'd problem. Have, Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'd love to have you back sometime. Have a great weekend. Thank you everyone for tuning in, in to another episode of Ant Security for All. And we will see you all next week. Have a great, safe weekend. Thanks everyone.